Hey guys, David here. Welcome back to the DGR podcast. This is episode number 106. I hope you're all doing well. I'm just going to do a short solo podcast for you guys today. All I seem to be able for these days is quickies. So um, let's get in, get it done, and let's get out of here. Um, <laughs> um, what? Let's read out the three questions first and foremost. Um, this is actually my second time doing this intro because I said that first time as well but then i added on something else and i i had to i had to bail out and i had to close it and start again i just went like one extra step too far so um here we are again so the three questions are do you use a lot of plyometric or landing type of work for your upper limb clients uh second one how do you keep clients motivated to do their exercises and stay committed to their rehab once they start to feel a bit better and then the third one is a question about content on Instagram in particular. How do you keep making content and staying motivated and all of that stuff? So those are three the three questions I'll try and tackle today. I'm not sure which order yet. Um, and yeah, those are just three that have been in my notes app, one of which I did have a conversation with someone only a couple of days ago about. So I'll, I'll talk about that. The other two, I think, were questions that I got on YouTube over the last few months so just one thing to note is let's say you have asked a question on youtube over the last few months on one of my podcasts because i did encourage you to do that and i haven't answered it yet that doesn't mean i'm not going to or i haven't um or that i haven't sorry i'm just going to put my phone on flight mode or that i'm just ignoring it what it means is they're probably resting in my notes app in my little podcast folder in my on my iphone so Again, for this podcast, if you're watching on YouTube, drop a little comment or something and question. And I promise, I don't promise, but because it might be a stupid question, but almost like you guys won't ask stupid questions, but very likely I will pop it into my notes app and I will answer it when the time is right, uh, which is just depending on the day. I just look at my notes. I'm like, right, I should I should record a podcast today. And then I look at my notes. I'm like, right, I think I'll answer this one and this one. And maybe I'll leave that one for another time. Um, August is doing is going pretty well for us. It's the middle of August. Um, I set myself like a little personal standard at the start of August to try and sweat every day, which has been good. I haven't ticked off that box. I haven't sweated every single day, but I've sweated most days, uh, almost every day. And that's that seems like an easy kind of a win, sweat every day, rather than saying, right, I need to train X amount or like have a particular type of training just sweat every day leaves it very open for me to okay i'll just go for a run okay i'll just go for on the bike in the gym or um uh on the treadmill in work or like yeah go to jujitsu like it just leaves it very open for me and sweat can only mean like you can get a sweat up in 10 minutes if you want so that's good even one day i really didn't want to i was a little bit sore what was wrong uh yeah, I was a bit sore somewhere and I didn't really want to go to jujitsu and I went and I just, it was an open mat where you can just kind of do as much or as little as you want. And I did, I think, four rolls, four rounds, four four minute rounds um, with a minute break in between, which is what, 16 minutes. I don't usually do public mats, but 16 minutes. And like, I was definitely sweating coming out of there. So like that little sweat every day box for me, that's a nice way of of encouraging me to just do enough and I don't have to go crazy uh, and just tick that box. We've also been sending out weekly emails to you guys. So hopefully you've been getting those and enjoying those emails where we're just putting in, I'm trying to cover like one little topic each week and put in pictures and just make it nice and helpful. So hopefully you've been enjoying those weekly emails and we're just trying to spread our content out a little bit more um, with the help of Ash, who we took on board as our... Uh, marketing person and she's been very very helpful for us and just helping me you know you know what's so helpful is just having someone else to help you do things and I know that sounds so obvious but like I put that off for so long we obviously we had Kira and we had like Chris and Alice and Mimi but just on the like marketing side of things on the content side of things on the email side of things just just having help is so, so underrated. And often a lot of us in the industry, we end up kind of 
you, you, you build your own little business around you as a coach or a physio or a, whatever you are, a therapist, and you end up doing everything yourself and you just end up with a job and then you end up like at the stage where, okay, for me to hire someone else and train them up and take them on is going to take so much work and so much effort. So, and, and like in your head, you're thinking they won't be as good as me at this thing. So it's actually much more effort for me to even hire someone. So I just keep doing it myself. And like, that's a very short term way of thinking about things. And it's not, it's not actually, if you want to grow and you want to kind of have some, some level of growth scale, but also not even growth or scale. You want to have some level of like, just chill for a while and actually let someone else do something for once in your life. Then uh, that is the way forward. So that's been helpful. And that's what, what is helping me and us start to, do uh, more variety broader variety of things and hopefully give you guys more content and more enjoyable content and helpful content and so on um okay so let me answer what's the first one how do you keep your clients motivated to do their exercise and stay committed to their rehab once they start to feel a little bit better um this is a question that doesn't just apply to rehab this applies to all of us let's say like everyone gets comfortable at some stage you in your job like i'm just talking about or your own business you hit a certain level of income or like level of whatever you would measure success with in your work or your life and you start to get a little bit comfortable and that's fine it's honestly fine i guess it just depends on what you're at, what you're actually looking for from your life or from your training or from your whatever and that applies to your clients as well so it is kind of a dangerous place to be for your clients though because a lot of people they just feel a little bit of pain relief and then suddenly they bail out on the thing that has been helping them and oftentimes they just end up back where they started but not with you they'll blame you for it they'll end up back where they started but with another coach or another physio or another whoever so you need to make sure that that doesn't happen and they they the 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 level of activity, intensity, frequency, volume that you're able to, and, and ver- variety uh, that they're able to handle in their body is more than what they need for their life or for their activity or for their sport. So that's very, very important that you're getting that in their training. And the answer here is to focus on making a bigger impact and make sure you're resetting their vision all of the time. Um, so and the same the same for yourself and your work like if you've got comfortable at a certain stage that's fine but you can't stay there forever stay comfortable for a little while but then at some stage you're gonna start contracting and and getting smaller and getting the, that comfort is not where you want to stay forever unless you're 70 or 80 years of age you need to keep growing not just because financially it's important uh maybe not at all because financially it's important it might not be important to you but the challenge that comes with trying to grow your business or grow your yeah grow your business let's say in this example that means that you need to be better as a person and have more skills and more knowledge so when you get too comfortable for too long you you're missing out on the challenge and the growth that comes with pushing ahead. So for your clients, if they're not doing their exercises, you need to make sure that you're resetting their vision and focusing always on making a bigger impact with them. And what that might mean is, okay, you, your, your pain, you, you are only focused on feeling a little bit better, but what if we could make you feel a lot better? Would that not be something you're interested in? And I would go even a step further, like, okay, I want to feel a little bit better versus I I want to feel a lot better. A lot better is much better. Uh, versus I want to feel a lot better versus I want to be able to get back playing tennis again. I want to get back playing tennis again versus I want to get back playing tennis again better than I ever have before and more uh, than I ever have before. So that's the bigger impact that you need to be able to make with someone and you need need to be able to communicate that. And to be honest, you should have probably been communicating that and agreed on that from the outset. This is why it's important, I think, to where possible to get clients signed up to slightly longer packages or plans or whatever uh it's important for your business and it's important for them 
in an ethical way to make sure that they are committed to something in the long term. And it's interesting that you'll see some people online kind of laughing at uh, therapists who sell package plans and stuff like that. But then at the same time, they laugh at the therapists who sell quick fixes. So if you want to be someone that's not selling a quick fix, oh, I will fix you in one session. No, you won't. If you want to be someone that's not selling that, then you need to be someone that can get someone to commit to, okay, we're not going to change 10 years of knee problems in two sessions. It's going to, I want you to commit to 12 weeks at a minimum here or eight weeks at a minimum or a, yeah, a session every week for eight weeks or a session every two weeks for 12 weeks or something like that. Uh, but to do that and to sell that ethically, you need to, communicate to them that we're working on something much bigger here than just okay my knee feels a little better than it did before it's getting to some level some kind of manageable level and so now i'm just going to bail out completely that has to be communicated from the outset that that is not the goal of this plan the goal is to get you feeling much better get you back playing tennis and get you back playing tennis uh, much better and being much more robust than before and also to stop you having to come back to me every three months or going to another physio or whoever every three months so always I would say if you're having that problem with people where they're falling out after one two three sessions or oh, oh, I just feel a little better I'm not going to come back then you are not focusing on making a big enough impact with them and you're not communicating that to them and if you have clients currently uh, that are falling into that trap if you haven't communicated that from the outset then what you need to do is have a good chat around resetting their vision and finding out where finding out where they currently are i guess that would go for our if you have staff in your business as well like what where are you currently and where do you want to be and maybe we can reset your vision so that you can focus on how you can make a bigger impact in our business and how we can make a bigger impact on your life as a result of that so I would say consistently focusing on making a bigger impact with your clients will get better results. And what is that saying? Um, shoot for the stars. And if you miss, you'll still land on a cloud or whatever like that. So with your, with your clients, you should shoot for the stars as much as possible. Not in a selling a dream kind of a way, but in a like, what would you do if you had no restrictions? I would go and I would play a tennis tournament every weekend let's aim for that and even if we don't end up hitting that exact perfect goal we'll still be way better than we would have been if we just focus on some small little impact like okay let's just make your knee feel a little bit better and then you stop coming for your sessions again so focus on number one focus on making a bigger impact and number two consistently reset vision in your life your your family's life your staff member's life your and most importantly obviously for this conversation your client's life like reset your vision what do you want and that will stop you getting bored to be honest that will stop them getting bored and that will give you energy to push forward and vision doesn't mean always have to be like it, it actually could be resetting your vision maybe in a in a different way it doesn't have to be bigger but it could just be in a different direction some of the time as well so yeah uh, I think that's a, probably like the best answer that you can get in terms of how do you keep your clients motivated. You can obviously have more micro answers where you could go in different directions and you need to explain to them why these exercises are important and you need to write a plan that is more exciting for them or they enjoy working on more or logistically it makes it better so that they don't have to go to the gym they just have to do them at home or they can get to exercise classes where they're working with other people like there's all these micro things that you can do which can make a big impact but ultimately what these pe these people will, if their vision isn't big enough or stretched enough uh, and you haven't focused on making a big enough impact with them, regardless of which of those little things that you implement with them, they are still going to eventually fall off the wagon because they don't have a reason to push and a reason and, and probably even the belief that they can do that. Or sometimes they need the permission from their coach that let's go for this. Let's push on a little bit here. So uh, that's what I would say there um okay second one i hope that was helpful uh second one i feel like i have a sneeze coming on one sec 
Mm, we're good. We'll push ahead. Um, okay. Second one. Do you use a lot of plyometric or landing type of work for your upper limb clients? Um, it depends on the person, the type of activity they need to do. It depends on the mechanism of an injury or their pain. So, for example, I had Paula down. Uh, some of you probably saw the videos that she was down a few months ago. So if you scroll back on Instagram, you will see them. And she had a fracture in her ulna or radius or boat playing a uh, camogie, which is an Irish sport. She actually fell, I think, on that side, and she it was quite a nasty injury. She was out for like eight months or something by the time she came down to see me, and um, she had done done a good like rehab and stuff, but she the one thing she was afraid of was getting back into sport and falling again, which is falling is a it's 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 almost guaranteed in in those in sports like rugby and Gaelic football and hurling and even soccer that like you're going to get shunted or dunted in one direction or another you're going to fall forwards or fall to the side and you're going to have to place your hand down to break your fall otherwise like that's just a reflex otherwise you're going to hit your head so that is uh almost guaranteed there so in a rehab like that it makes complete sense and it makes it makes it is it would be nonsensical to not make upper limb plyo type of work impact work whatever you want to call it a big part of her rehab at that stage and if you look at the videos that we were doing we were uh pushing like in a press up position pushing off two hands landing on two hands pushing off two hands landing on one hand landing with more let's say it was her i think it was her left hand landing with that more in the midline of the body out to the side of the body up to 12 o'clock like overhead kind of in a press up position um being very stiff through the wrist where we were like springing more like an actual plyometric being more sinky um and just doing loads of that stuff. And when you look at her, the videos of her, her thumb was always in this kind of gammy position where it was, um, it was all, her hand was all kind of scrunched up and she wasn't actually, she was like falling to the outside of the hand and she wasn't loading properly and fully, properly is not a great word, but more evenly and fully through the hand. She was, there was a big, like a, quite a sizable uh avoidance strategy going on which might be a, might be the right word so we worked on really like learning to spread the hand and um weight bear kind of through the through the inside of the hand um yeah and just more evenly and spreading the hand can be very useful just like spreading the foot can be very useful where we're getting someone to really load into the middle part of the foot or the hand and then shifting your weight in different directions once you've done that so uh so yeah um I would say plyometrics or upper limb impact type of work is huge if any of you've done the upper body basics program you will see how we prepare for that with some of our like wall press ups and kind of wall pogo type of stuff with the hands and i think that's very very helpful and actually that can help a lot of people's shoulder pain and neck pain too they're just super weak and not used to creating tension through the hand and just not very mobile through the hand and the wrist and the elbow a lot of the time but and, and so the, so yes is the answer for a certain type of person which is a rugby player a soccer player anyone a, a boxer obviously anyone who's had a specific injury and needs to get back to impact but if you just have someone with a more generic is prob probably not the right word but i don't like using the non-specific word either but let's just say shoulder pain some kind of shoulder pain like i don't usually find the answer is in the impact stuff not that i wouldn't train it but i usually find that uh they just don't move their shoulder and their rib cage particularly well so i would spend much more time usually on that stuff to be honest um so getting the shoulder blade moving really well getting the rib cage particularly the upper rib cage now nah, let's say the whole rib cage moving really well making sure that the upper part of the rib cage in the front and the back so the chest and the upper back can fill up with air i find that huge for shoulder issues to be honest um and that can be that's the hardest place to to get 
anterior to posterior expansion in my in my opinion is higher up in the sternum and higher up in the upper back it's it's very difficult for people uh lower down is often a little bit easier so a to b expansion uh shoulder blade stuff and then good shoulder strength as well um so i what i will say is like your question is do you use a lot of plyometric and landing type of work i use some and i use a lot with the right person but with more upper limb with upper limb clients more generally speaking i use a lot of um let, let's let's look at it this way who is the best who has the best shoulders in the world gymnasts and uh climbers are probably the two i know you'll probably say it's someone else and maybe it is as well, but two, two, two populations who have great shoulders and great upper limb, like wrist, elbow, shoulder, upper back, chest, let's say, uh, gymnasts and climbers. And what do both of those people do? Number one, they spend a lot of time with their arms over their head. Number two, they do a lot of grip type of work um, and, and actually kind of have to yeah, let's just say grip work. Like if the gymnasts are on the bar, the, the, the P bars and the uneven bars and handstand type of stuff. And obviously climbers are climbing a lot. Um, so that's number two. Number three, they have to kind of land and pull and push in different directions with their arms in different uh orientations so that's three and four they train a lot and they put so much load through their upper body uh so yeah and and mm, is there a five there is, but I don't want to go into that right now. So th- those are four big things. So if you look at what those two sports have in common is that they move through a lot of range of motion. They build a ton of strength through a lot of range of motion and they incorporate the full um, limb together pretty much. Like there's very little isolation work. There's very little, this just requires an elbow here or this just requires a hand or a shoulder like everything has to reach out in a funny angle and pull or push from that angle um which requires the spine to have to do something with it and the rib cage to have to do something and the scap and even the neck to have to bend in a certain way so with that being said i would say that i use a lot more with my upper limb clients i'm trying to mimic not mimic but i'm trying to like kind of copy those type of patterns a lot more than i would be trying to copy uh like landing patterns for the upper limb i just don't find it quite as useful and let's look at it this way like i bet you a climber would have no problem doing uh, a landing where you get them on their knees and you drop into a like a plyo push-up type of position like a climber has no problem with that they don't train that but they train to be just unbelievably strong with their shoulders and their elbows and their wrists in a multitude of positions so i would say that is much more important and that is probably those type of climbing positions so what basically what i'm trying to get to is spend time with your clients hanging from different positions when I was doing a lot of like Edo Portal training, we just did so much hanging and braciating and swinging and pulling and pushing patterns in so many different directions. And I think that for upper limb, for shoulders is money, to be honest. And that's what I try and do with my clients. You'll see videos on our page of doing like scap pull-ups and arching scap pull-ups and kind of side to side scap pull-ups and, um, like we used to do a lot of front lever stuff and planche type of work, planche push up type of work. Um, always like typewriter type of push ups where you're going side to side. Uh, lots of scap work, and I do really like isolating the shoulder a little bit more, to be honest. Especially in like adduction and abduction, which I've spoken on other podcasts. But there's just that's that's what I would say. Get the shoulder, the scap, the spine, the rib cage all moving together and build strength through there. And you can layer on a little bit of the landing type of stuff or a lot for a particular person. But copy what the best people do. 
or at least learn from what the best people do. And for the upper limb, the best people are climbers and gymnasts. So look at the patterns that they use with their pulling and their pushing from more adducted and abducted positions, more uh, amounts of flexion and extension, more amounts of um, just a variety and particularly involving a lot of spine and ribcage movement with that. And you will get incredible results with your upper limb clients. Most shoulder people come to you and they say, I've tried everything and nothing has helped. And like, what have they tried? They've tried, they've tried rotator cuff work. They've tried, um, to stretch their pec. They have tried, like to modify a barbell bench press into a dumbbell bench press and like all those things are good what i'm saying but like they just haven't moved their arm around that much to be honest they haven't moved their scap around and they haven't moved their their rib cage around and they haven't moved their neck around they just haven't moved that much so get them moving and pulling and pushing in different directions and honestly that will look after most of your rib i'm sorry most of your rotator cuff problems that people discuss they're just not moving their shoulder and loading it in different directions they're just doing so much isolation work which is fine it's a nice supplement but it's not the whole thing and the whole thing is moving your shoulder with the spine moving a lot as well and the scap moving in the rib cage here's the sneeze again hang on <coughs> excuse me there we go um okay so hopefully that helps for the upper limb thing copy climbers and gymnasts don't have to go climbing or gymnastics but just take some of the patterns that they use and incorporate them into your rehab or your training and then some of the plyo stuff is like the upper limb plyo stuff is honestly easy stand up hands against the wall push off the wall land on the wall push off the wall on one on two land on one land on two do that on the floor do it in different directions um do it where you push off the floor in a push-up position land with your hand on the wall just do loads of that and that's so easy to be honest um okay third and final question which was about content how do you keep making content staying motivated um (laughs) here is the unserious answer but actually the right answer which is i am a shark (laughs) hang on i still have a uh uh nose thing going on here starting to drip a little bit i am a shark sharks wake up they don't think about will i swim today they just go and swim so honestly i've thought a lot about the content side of things for many years now like five or six years i've been thinking about it all of the time and trying to convince myself to do this and that and the best way of thinking about it for me is that i am a shark sharks just wake up and swim so i am someone who does content i just wake up and i do content uh it's not i'm not saying it's the only thing i do but i view it like that when it's time to like have i posted today no okay post like that's as much of the thought process that goes into my on in my mind obviously i still have to figure out what i need to post but I am a shark. Shark wakes up. Have I swam yet today? No. Okay, swim. It's not like, a, oh, I really need to motivate myself or convince myself to go and swim. No, just need to wake up and you, d- you do content. That That's it for me at the moment. Um, now, it does help when you ha- make revenue, you make money from making content. So I have very measurable uh i have measurables that when i post x amount we make x amount of money so i'm not doing it out of good for the good of my health uh but the only way you can get to that stage is by being a shark and actually waking up and doing content and then you have measurables and those measurables allow you to stay accountable and consist more consistent i would say but if you're struggling and you have found your found it difficult to convince yourself to stay motivated and to figure out how to keep doing it then maybe you're overthinking it and maybe you just need to think about being a shark for a while just wake up and swim uh maybe that's a good way of thinking about training sometimes i'm a shark i just wake up and swim like do i need to convince myself to train today 
I, I'm not saying me, I probably do, but maybe if I brought that mindset better to my training, which is, do I need to like, oh, what, what training do I need to do? Or do I need to convince myself and motivate myself? And how many steps do I need to do? Honestly, it's probably better to just be like, I'm a shark. I wake up and I swim. I wake up, I train today. That's it. It's not like a conversation that happens. It's just, I wake up, I swim. That's because that's what I do. So that is currently how I keep myself motivated in terms of making content. It is not a conversation in my head. It is not a question. It is not a should I do this or will I do this or like how often are I a deal with myself or anything like that. It's just I'm a shark. I wake up and swim. So I'm a content person. I wake up and I make content. I don't mean I wake up and instantly make content, but I just do it do it that day. So uh, maybe that I haven't been a shark with the podcast. I haven't been a shark with many other things, but with Instagram, I'm a shark. Uh, so that's how I put it, and I hope that helps. Um, okay, that was a all over the place podcast. Hopefully, it was helpful. I do say that probably after every single podcast, and I always do think that they were terrible today did feel particularly weird for some reason i'm not sure why maybe it's because i didn't have my coffee with me but i felt like a little bit uh not coherent which i'm sure you guys noticed as well um okay this is me about to finish now the podcast i need to record a dgri video where i'm going to talk about uh, nate asked me a question in the after the last podcast he emailed us in the last podcast at the end of the last podcast i mentioned how tall kneeling is a nice position to work on for breathing work. And I'm going to do a little uh, 10 or 15 minute video for our member site on that, on the tall kneeling position and what you can use in the tall kneeling position and why I think that. Uh, so I think that would be a very, very valuable uh, video to watch. If you're not part of DGR Interactive, make sure you sign up. We have over a thousand coaches and therapists watching our videos on there and learning they're all short videos 10 or 15 minutes long uh we have hundreds of hours of content on there that you can just dip in and out of uh so i think that's a must we get emails and messages from people every single day saying like genuinely saying i actually can't believe the level of this content when i make time to watch it every single time i watch something i learn something or i have a big aha and i'm able to like incorporate that into the stuff that I use with clients almost straight away so DJ Interactive is the most valuable thing that you could get as a coach or a therapist to just excuse me to just start it start learning faster uh still at your own pace but just accelerate your learning uh otherwise our programs we have lower body basics one and two that's where we start with all our hip clients pelvis lower back stuff groins knees hamstrings we have that's more of the generic strength and mobility they're more generic strength and mobility programs with upper body basics which i spoke a bit about in this podcast shoulders elbows wrists scaps the bonus next section there is money just for that alone you, you should get it for people that have tight necks um sore necks necks that need to move and necks that breathe a lot for people we need to change those patterns um we have our foot ankle and achilles program which we just made some updates to uh so if you log in if you've already got it if you're one of the five thousand people that has it though that has uh an updated it will have automatically updated so you'll see all the new nice exercises in there and um that has four phases that's what i use with all my shin calf um perineal tip post uh, achilles plantar fascia big toe i'm slapping my foot i'm slapping the different parts of my foot here as i say things um or, or anything from the the knee down let's say will benefit from that program and we've core basics and then we'll have the hip new hip program coming soon so Hope that helps for the podcast. Give me some feedback, drop a comment on YouTube, let me know on Instagram, something like that. All of those are appreciated and uh, have a great week or have a great weekend. Talk to you guys soon.